Well, good afternoon. By the way, I noticed, uh, Madam Attorney General, notice we put you on the couch. I guess that's what we're all supposed to do here, us in the media. We, we always want to put uh, elected officials and administration officials on the couch. So here we go. You're right I'm on the couch. To, I'm happy to tell you how I'm <laughs> feeling today, Chuck. Um, I, I love this. That, not that any of you need uh, to uh, uh, learn a little bit more uh, about, uh, is it still fair to call you our new attorney general? Do you feel new still? No. Okay, fair enough. <laughs> But what did Pre President Obama had a great description. He's like, she's the only lawyer in America who battles mobsters and drug lords and terrorists and still has a reputation for being a charming people person. So there you go. <laughs> <laughs> Let me start. Uh, I guess I, I am on the couch today. There you are. You're on the couch. <laughs> Let me start. You guys have a big announcement today from the Justice Department. I think you're making the announcement right here, right now, about a new grant program uh, to help communities uh, deal with recidivism rates, if you want to take it away. Yes, thank you. I am delighted to announce that today the Department of Justice is awarding $53 million in what are called second chance grants. This is an important part of the department's work in making sure that people coming out of prisons have an opportunity to rebuild their lives and that their communities also stay safe. These grants will be aimed at organizations in 45 different jurisdictions. They focus on things as varied as father and son interaction, job training, education, the many, many barriers that we have seen in the way of people coming out of our prisons uh, to becoming productive citizens again. That's the goal. That's the goal. We're very involved with the Department of Justice, obviously, in fundamental fairness and individual accountability and making sure that people do, in fact, uh, serve time when they need to. But then there comes a time when we have to make a decision as to how we are going to reintegrate those individuals back into our society in a way that benefits them as well as keeps our communities safe. All right, it's a grant program, um, which means it, that, that always has the, the whiff of experimental to me, um, meaning that not everybody, not every community who needs it is going to get it. Is that fair? Well, I think unfortunately we still have limited dollars, um, but uh, jurisdictions and organizations can apply. We try and look at organizations' track records in this field. We look at their experience, not just anecdotal, but where we can find it, actual records of success in reintegrating of individuals into their community. The application process is all on our website. Our Office of Justice Programs is the main body that will be uh, managing these grants. Give me an example of a community that's been doing this well that probably will end up with one of these grants. Well, I can't predict who will get the grant, but what I can tell you is that when I was the U.S. Attorney in Brooklyn, um, a district that I was proud to lead, we had within our district, I had five counties, uh, Brooklyn, Queens, Long Island, Staten Island, and we had a lot of tremendous progress in crime reduction and safety, but we had some entrenched pockets, uh, particularly in Brooklyn and Queens. One neighborhood was Brownsville. It's about a mile square. Uh, and many of its residents are young people who literally never leave that neighborhood, unfortunately, except when the young men go to jail. Um, so we saw this cycle over and over again, and we were involved very directly in reentry programs in that community in conjunction with the DA's office, where it wasn't just the U.S. Attorney's office, the DA's office, talking to returning offenders about the costs of reoffending. It was also providing them with educational services, with family management services, mm -hmm. and information on housing and things that are such real barriers. Those are the types of programs that we're looking to support. You know, during the Katrina. 10-year anniversary, there was a ton of studies that got released, and one of the most fascinating ones had to do with recidivism rates. And the prisoners that went back to the Ninth Ward, if their family was in the Ninth Ward, their recidivism rate was higher than basically going back to the old neighborhood yeah. versus if their family, if they had nowhere to go, and while they were in prison, their family relocated to Houston Moved. or Atlanta, the recidivism rate dropped almost in half, I believe this one study said. That, to me, sounds like the answer. It's almost that like that was the best evidence I'd seen anywhere, that, that the best way to deal with recidivism rates is relocate folks out of neighborhoods. Is that, is you know, that one of the goals of this program? Well, I don't, the goal of the program is not to remove people from their homes or their neighborhoods, although there is some interesting uh, research and data coming out of the Department of Housing and Urban Development that talks about exactly what you mentioned, but in a larger sense which is that where you live matters. It matters because of your access to services. It matters because of your access to education. It matters because of your access to a certain quality of life. And certainly, post-Katrina, the Ninth Ward suffered 
so tremendously, both during the storm, after the storm, and frankly, even still today, that I think many residents returning were, were working so hard just to get the basics of life and hold it together that people would not have had access to that. So individuals who went to different locations were plugged into networks of support that were stronger than they would have found in the Ninth Ward. So our goal is not to move people from their neighborhoods. Our goal is to strengthen neighborhoods to support people coming back into them. All right, I'm going to shift gears here to, I think that deserves, absolutely. I'm going to shift gears here to criminal justice reform. I know Surely. you're going to be focused on this just today, and I think, yes. in fact, there's going to be some talk, either it's already happened or it will happen. My apologies for not having the schedule with me. Um, but you have Senators Booker, Democrat, New Jersey, Lee, Republican, Utah. They've got their uh, criminal justice reform legislation they're introducing today. Life sentences under the three strikes uh, in your outlaw would be dropped to 25 years. 20-year mandatory sentences reduced to 15. For crimes, crimes that require 10-year sentences, judges would have more discretion to assign shorter terms. Bill includes prison programs for rehabilitation, uh, dealing with juveniles, uh, putting new limits on placing juveniles in solitary confinement. In general, you supportive of this, uh, the goals of this legislation? This legislation, I think, represents an important opportunity for all of us to look at how we administer criminal justice in this country. It's the goal of the Department of Justice to protect the American people, but in a way that is efficient, transparent, and fair. Sentencing reform has been uh, a topic of great bipartisan discussion. Right. I think today's announcement, frankly, is a great step forward. Uh, we commend and thank Senators Booker, Senator Lee, also the other senators who worked on this. A number of senators crossed the aisle to come together with different ideas on how to improve our system. Certainly, as a longtime prosecutor, I remember prosecuting cases where we looked at people who were being cycled through a system, nonviolent drug offenders who were facing severe mandatory minimums, um, either being deported or going back home, um, and you really couldn't see the utility in it. Whereas we really needed to focus our resources on the kingpins, the true leaders and organizers of the narcotics organization. So it's something that the Department of Justice has been focused on for a long time. My predecessor, Eric Holder, mm -hmm. as you recall, introduced the Smart on Crime initiative, which did redirect our resources in the narcotics area for nonviolent offenders into an area where judges and prosecutors had more discretion. A lot of that's mirrored in this bill, so we're incredibly grateful to see that. And I'm looking forward to working with all the senators. What's not in here that you hope, you, you, that you hope some folks get in there yet, or do you not? Uh, is there anything in here yet that you'd like to see in the bill? Well, we're still looking at the bill. And I think there's going to be a number of people who are going to have comments on it. We've had a very positive working relationship across the aisle uh, with the senators from both sides, both parties, mm -hmm. on all their thoughts on reform. So we're looking forward to continuing those discussions. All right, let's talk about what this year has been a lot about when it comes to the relationship, particularly between African Americans uh, and, and the police. You've been going on a, on a, a multi-city tour yes. uh, on this. Uh, I think you've gone in different places. And I was struck by one anecdote. You went to Birmingham, and a 15-year-old comes up to you and says, I was raised to hate the police. And how did you react to that? You know, it's painful to hear that. Um, you're right, I have been on a six-city community policing tour. We chose these six cities. Birmingham was one, Birmingham, Cincinnati, Pittsburgh, East Haven. I just got back from Seattle and Richmond, California. And we chose those cities because they have all had a challenged relationship between the police and law enforcement. Shootings, negative interactions, Department of Justice intervention, um, lawsuits, pattern and practice investigations, and exactly the kind of relationship that you outline mm -hmm. there, where residents talk about a deeply ingrained sense of lack of trust, but a larger issue, a lack of connection, really, to, uh, to the forces that should be protecting them. And I was able to speak with, I've been able to speak with young people in every city in which I have visited. And Birmingham was uh, particularly rewarding because that young person was involved in a program where high school students worked directly with police. Um, we are looking for cities that have had, as I've said, a challenging, challenging relationship with law enforcement, but yet have found a way to rebuild a relationship, to sort of claw themselves back from the brink, and not create a perfect situation, because 
that doesn't exist. But to find a way in which when problems develop, there is a mechanism for discussion, there's a process for transparency, and where residents and law enforcement have a working relationship. So one of the ways in which Birmingham has been doing that is the program that you were referring mm -hmm. to having police officers talk directly to young people uh, through an exercise through, with the Birmingham Police Department. They're involved in these role-playing exercises, and it is a way of breaking down the barriers that are created by a uniform. Whether your uniform is dress blues or baggy pants, people will look at you from either side of wherever they stand and make a judgment, oftentimes, about what you mean, what you want to do, you know, your views about them. So by building those connections and letting young people work directly with law enforcement, frankly, that young person came to know that police officers were just like them. They had families, mm -hmm. they had concerns, they cared about what was happening to the people they were, they were working with. Mm -hmm. And I think, quite frankly, the most successful exercise was the one in which the, they do a role reversal and the young people play the role of the police officers, and the police officers play the role of rowdy teenagers who won't get out of a park. <laughs> and watching the young people deal with that, first of all, the officers' enjoyment, but any, if you've been a parent, you know what that's like. Um, but watching the young people deal with that and having them come to understand just how hard a job it is to be a police officer, how many things you have to think about and balance every time you interact with someone, whether they're a young person or an older member of the community, and how easy it can be to let a situation escalate, and the importance of working to build those connections. Well, we do have a trust deficit also with statistics. For instance, you know, we keep track of violent crime rates, but we don't, we don't have, and you tell me if the Justice Department, if you're going to try to fix this, but there doesn't seem to be a uniform way to keep track of, of when a police officer discharges his weapon. You we know, don't feel as if there is not, I mean, right now, the best statistic is done by a newspaper, a news organization, that's based in Europe. Mm -hmm. Here in the, I mean, The Guardian, I think, is doing this. Yes. That's kind of atrocious, is it not? Yes. Well, I'm not going to comment on news organizations keeping numbers. I think they do a pretty good job sometimes. You know, you raise an important point about keeping track of what happens. I think one of the things that we have seen, however, with the recent incidents that have been captured on videotape, um, I think people have been able to see, people in the larger community have been able to see what members of minority communities have talked about really for decades, if not generations, about the different types of interactions that people can have with law enforcement and also how whether or not an officer is trained in calming a situation down or lets the situation escalate, they have seen the difference that that makes. That's been hard for people to understand if they haven't experienced it, if they haven't had that, that sense that there's a bit of a divide and a disconnect there. So while we don't have actual numbers, and frankly... Why? The, Why can't we do this? Why can't this become a... I mean, is this just something that... Congress has to pass a law to like sort of man make it mandatory that all police uh, you tell me, how would, what would it take for you to be able to have these statistics at hand? Well, one of the ways in which we're looking to gather information exactly on this front um, is through our work with local law enforcement. We do a lot of work with local law enforcement in a, in a very collaborative manner. They often reach out to the department for technical assistance, for training, and sometimes we also, as you know, have police jurisdictions under, have police departments, right. I should say, under our jurisdiction in enforcement actions. Ferguson, for instance, now is. One of the things right. that we have been Correct. Am I right about that with Ferguson? Well, Ferguson, we, we issued a report right. on Ferguson's practices uh, that were not just about policing, but about the larger relationship of the municipality right. with the residents, which I will tell you, I think if, if you had the opportunity to, to read that. It was a an, an stunning, if read it, it was, yes. it was really sad. But it illustrates angry, the root causes yeah. of a lot of the feeling of disconnect that many members of minority communities feel towards the police. Because the police are often the only face of government that they see. And so very often the police get the brunt of a lot of the frustration and the anger and confusion and dissatisfaction over municipal policies such as we saw in Ferguson. This exacerbates this divide and this trust, one of the things we're working on. But when we have a consent decree or even collaborative reform, we do impose record keeping requirements on police departments. And what I will say is, no one likes extra paperwork. I hear that all the time. But 
they find it extremely helpful to, as you pointed out, Chuck, to be able to indicate how many times a police officer simply interacts with a member of the community. How many times does that interaction result in a ticket? How many times does it result in the officer having to draw their weapon? How many times does it result in shots being fired? And there actually are some police departments out there that do an excellent job of recording how many times a shot is fired, if mm -hmm. a weapon is discharged, for example. But you just said some police departments do a good job of this. We don't have a national system on this. We don't. Should, should we? We don't. You know, I think one of the things we're focusing on with the Department of Justice is not trying to reach down from Washington and dictate to every local department how they should handle the minutia of, of record keeping, but we are stressing to them that the, these records must be kept. A lot of times it's a resource issue for small departments. You know, the average size of a police department in this country mm -hmm. is around 55 people. Right. You know, a lot of them are very small, uh, and municipalities are challenged. This is not to say, uh, not to excuse not doing this, because it is, in fact, a very important tool for tracking these interactions. So we encourage it. And we also are looking to encourage consistency of standards. As you've pointed out, you can get information from one department, mm -hmm. but if you can't match it up or marry it up, to other information, it may not give you a true picture. But the real issues here, Chuck, I mean, the, the statistics are important, right. but the real issues are what steps are we all taking to connect communities that often feel disenfranchised and disaffected with the police and back with government? All right, let's talk about uh, the rising crime rate. I've, we've seen it here, you know, a select number of cities here where it's just up significantly, including right here in Washington. Milwaukee, 76%, St. Louis, 60%. These are murder rates. Baltimore, 56 percent. Washington, 44 percent. Have you found a trend yet? I know you're doing a summit in a week on this, <laughs> yes, so right. I know that what part of your answer is going to be about this summit that you're holding, but have we come up? Is this, do you think it's statistical noise, or is there something happening out there? Well, look, I think every loss of life is a tragedy, and I, I don't think we can consign anyone's death to statistical noise, to, to, be, to be frank. Um, we're looking at this issue. We're looking to see if we can identify the root causes of it. Crime overall is down. Violent crime overall is down. But we have these persistent pockets where we see at times a resurgence in the violent crime rate and the homicide rate, as you noted. We are having a convening next week. Thank you for the lead-in, Chuck. <laughs> Much appreciated. Uh, we are inviting not just the mayors and police chiefs, but also the federal prosecutors uh, of the, some of the cities that are affected by this to come to Washington and sit down and talk about the trends that they have seen. I had previously directed all the U.S. attorneys in jurisdictions where this was an issue to convene a local gathering and talk with their local law enforcement about what they were seeing on the ground. Is it, for example, a meth problem? You know, is there an increase in certain types of activity? We also have There's a huge sadly, heroin problem. I mean, right now, the presidential candidates are hearing about it front and center because absolutely. New England in general and New Hampshire specifically has this huge heroin issue. Absolutely. The heroin and, frankly, opioids in general, the prescription drug epidemic of a few years ago is really still with us. So we, I've asked the U.S. attorneys to talk to their local law enforcement. Is that the issue? Um, is it an issue, uh, you know, arising out of gang violence? You know, it's going to be different for every jurisdiction. Another theory that's out there those. particularly has to do with as, poli as, as police have gotten a bad rap this year, do some some criminals feel empowered. Well, I can tell you that when I've gone out and talked to police departments, specifically the six departments I've been to, um, and they've all talked about the increase in community policing, the steps that they are taking for de-escalation, they are all in cities where crime has gone down. Mm -hmm. So I think that, frankly, police involvement is a helpful thing overall. Uh, that's what we're seeing. One of the things, I want to go back to criminal justice reform, because one of it has to do, a lot of the focus has always been about nonviolent drug offenders. Yes. One of the easiest way you could clean this up is if, you're, if the government rescheduled marijuana. Marijuana is a Schedule I drug as, as the equivalent of heroin and all this stuff versus, for instance, it's considered a more lethal drug, essentially, than Vicodin. Mm -hmm. um, it should... Would it be easier to deal with this sentencing issue if marijuana were reclassified? And would you support the reclassification of marijuana? I think if you want to look at the population uh, of people who have been subject to over-incarceration, particularly at the federal level, um, we look at the situation from, as I mentioned before, the societal cost as well as the financial cost 
uh, and the cost in terms of human productivity. The majority of those individuals usually were victims of the cocaine crack imbalance mm -hmm. uh, of several years ago, which has been corrected significantly but still exists. And so for us if, at the federal level, we're looking at individuals, nonviolent offenders, not the kingpins, again, not the, not the large-scale importers of heroin and cocaine, uh, but that's been the focus of the federal government and, pres and prescription drugs But you've been a U.S. Well. attorney. Would, if the reclassification of marijuana, would that, would, that make your, would that make it easier for you to focus on the real offenders? Well, in terms of as a federal prosecutor, and, and certainly we do continue to do marijuana cases at the federal level, we focus on those large-scale importers where the violence occurs. Mm -hmm. and, and unfortunately, there is still a lot of violence associated uh, with large-scale importation of marijuana. Uh, there's a lot of firearms involved. Um, and, and frankly, um, because with, wherever there's a lot of money changing hands, mm -hmm. you will find that occurring. So at the federal level, for us, we focus on the larger-scale dealers. Um, I think in terms of your issue, your question about rescheduling of marijuana, we're looking at the nonviolent drug offenders who have been swept up mm -hmm. primarily in the crack and the cocaine wars. Um, a vital tool. I was a prosecutor in the 90s. I mm -hmm. remember those days. I remember the violence. I remember the fear in mm -hmm. many minority communities. But we're looking now at the collateral consequences of those policies and trying to essentially find a way to mitigate them. Are you comfortable that the federal government is allowing the states Washington, Oregon, I believe, started today uh, selling marijuana <laughs> legally. Uh, Washington State, uh, and obviously the federal government's made a decision to not overrule those laws. You comfortable with that decision? Well, I think states have to make those decisions um, on their own. They listen to their citizens and they take actions. What we have said and what we continue to say is that states have to also have a system designed to, number one, mitigate violence associated with their marijuana industries, and number two, and perhaps most importantly, keep young people, children, away from the products. The concern that we have, uh, we're seeing a number of situations where children gain access to products that look like candy or cookies mm -hmm. or cakes. Um, the purity is different, and they're becoming very, very ill. We also have concerns, and states have expressed this to me, where a state where has, that has not legalized this particular substance right. sees people traveling across state lines to obtain it. We do still intervene, and we will still intervene in those areas. And I know we're at the zero. Federal government need to regulate this, you think, at a minimum, though? A little more tougher regulation. If the states are going to do this, you just mentioned the candy issue. Well, we, Is that something you think Congress ought to We still have a very strong enforcement policy there, and mm -hmm. we, we've said repeatedly that states need to have a regime in place to deal with these issues, and for the federal government is still in intervening and is still looking at, at situations and cases where those are the issues. Our overall goal is the protection of the American people. All right. Madam Attorney General, I will leave it there. Okay. Thank you very much.